Thank you. The Bible and the Great Seal of the United States. I do pray the last several broadcasts have been interesting enough that many of you folks have decided to follow with me in the Bible as I expand this series to show that both our official emblem, the Great Seal, and America itself can be found in God's holy word. The Great Seal has an eagle with outstretched wings, an olive branch, a bundle of arrows, thirteen stars above the eagle's head surrounded by a cloud, and the banner in his beak with the Latin E Pluribus Unum, meaning out of many, one. Every one of these objects has a scriptural origin, every one of them has a Bible meaning, and they tell a rather amazing story, part of which we have already seen. So far we've only discussed the eagle, in the Bible the symbol of God Almighty Himself, and His wings, the symbol of God's overshadowing power over a nation or a people. That power can be used by God for protection, for guidance, for blessing, and yes, even for judgment and destruction. As you have perhaps already realized, America has had God's blessing far above any other people, but we are now coming under the judging hand of God because of our national and personal sins. After we finish in Isaiah 18, we'll go on and see why, of all the trees and shrubs of the world, our forefathers placed an olive branch in the eagle's talon, why the arrows in the other, why the stars, and so on. For new listeners who may not know just what our great seal looks like, if you have a one dollar bill, you will find it reproduced on the back side. And if you stay with us for all of this Bible study, we shall see the great seal is a visible evidence of God's hand in the affairs of our beloved America. The order for its design was passed on July 4, 1776, by the Continental Congress, the same day they adopted the Declaration of Independence. And as I said on a previous broadcast, that was the day on which a nation was born in a day according to Bible prophecy. During the last two broadcasts, we read of the land described in Isaiah 18, the land shadowing with wings. There are nine descriptive phrases in the two verses of Isaiah 18. A few of them will fit almost any large land area, but it should be of startling significance that all nine fit with amazing clarity the United States of America. And if the first one, the land shadowing with wings, does indeed indicate the protective presence and blessing of God Almighty, what nation in all of the world can claim such a near presence to God as America? Yes, I know we are full of wickedness and sin. I know our present leaders are practically all non-Christians and have little, if any, respect for God and His Word, but that does not change the truth of our past history, that the United States of America had a Christian foundation laid by our forefathers. America of all the nations of the world, most nearly fits the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, spoken of so often in the prophetic scripture. We got only as far as verse 3 of Isaiah 18. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he lifteth up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. The trumpet in Scripture is a prophetic symbol for God's Word, or more particularly, the preaching of that Word. So the world was to look and see an ensign on the mountains when they heard the Word of God being preached. An ensign is a sign or a flag or a banner, identifying the people or the place hoisting the banner. And we then turn to Isaiah 11, where God had proclaimed through the prophet just what that ensign was, the world would see being raised on the mountains. In just a moment we will continue in Isaiah 11, but first I will offer our free literature for the month of October. Everyone likes fairy stories, and I have written a small booklet about one, Cinderella. 
You all know the story, so I won't repeat it here, but how many of you know that Cinderella is a Bible story? Well, it is, and a beautiful one. So when you write, I will send you my 24-page booklet, Cinderella, A Bible Story. In it I show the biblical identity of the prince, the wicked stepmother, the stepsisters, the godmother, the carriage, the ball, the palace, and yes, Cinderella, of course. Once you read this, you will probably wonder why you never realized it yourself, but don't be embarrassed. Millions of our people have read and heard and saw scores of versions of Cinderella without ever realizing it was an allegory of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and the Bible story of his bride. And there I've given away the key, and now you know it all. No, you don't. You write for it anyway. I am sure you will enjoy this little book, Cinderella, A Bible Story. Then we have two more smaller articles, one by Professor Revelo Oliver, Christianity, Religion of the West. Professor Oliver makes the statement with which I agree that past and present history gives adequate proof that Christianity is the unique possession of the white race, and that in spite of our long and valiant efforts to teach our religion to other races, and in spite of of the glowing reports about Christian missionary work among the heathen, we have failed in our efforts to plant Christianity among the colored peoples of the earth. This is not a long, vague argument against missions, but a short and to-the-point four-page article which should be read by every churchgoer in the nation. Professor Oliver says more in these four pages than most of us can do in forty. You should read it, Christianity, Religion of the West. And then I'll send along a small tract of mine which answers the question, Who are the Israelites? Address your letter or postcard to America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. I am Pastor Emery, and the broadcast is America's Promise, but if you can't remember either of them, just be sure you get Post Office Box 5334, Phoenix. Back to our study of the Bible and the Great Seal of the United States. We were reading in Isaiah 11 to identify the ensign spoken of in Isaiah 18. In verse 10 of Isaiah 11 we read, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign for the people. The phrase, root of Jesse, which is elaborated on in verse 1, makes the ensign easily identifiable as Jesus Christ. Jesse, of course, as you Bible students know, was the father of David, and Jesus came through the Davidic line. The verses in between make it plain the prophet is speaking of he who would rule over the people of the earth in an age when the wolf would dwell with the lamb, the leopard lie down with the kid, the lion eat straw as the ox, and so on in verses 6 and 7. In verse 9 it says, The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then comes the prophecy, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. Again, an ensign is a flag or a banner or a sign proclaiming the identity or allegiance of the people who fly that ensign. If Jesus Christ is the ensign, and he is, then the people spoken of here in Isaiah would have to be a Christian people. Verse 10 goes on. To it, or to that ensign, shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Gentiles here comes from the Hebrew word goy, and it is usually translated nations or peoples. To it, to the banner of Jesus Christ, shall the nation seek. That that seeking or that congregating under that banner or ensign would come before the kingdom age is made plain in the next verses, which prophesy at some length about the regathering of the Israel people. The implication here being rather clear that the Israel people would be regathered from various parts of the earth by coming to or giving their allegiance to 
the ensign to Jesus the Christ. Verse 11, And it shall come to pass in that day, what day? Well, the day spoken of in the previous verse, when the root of Jesse would stand for an ensign of the people. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, and from Pathros, and from Cush, and so on. And he lists the former abodes of the Israel people. In the next verse we can see this regathering is a great event. And he shall set up an ensign, and here is that word again which stands for Jesus Christ, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Several things are obvious here, and of vital importance to our study of America in the Bible. First, this regathering of the nations would be the Israel nations. Secondly, this regathering of Israel could not have been the return from Babylon. That return involved less than 50,000 people of the Judah kingdom, and they came only from Babylon. It was certainly not a huge regathering from, quote, the four corners of the earth, unquote. Thirdly, it cannot in any way fit the movement of a few millions of people who call themselves Jews to the land of old Palestine. I know the majority of ministers have been taught and try to teach that the Jews going to Palestine is the fulfillment of these prophecies of the regathering of Israel. But God has given us adequate evidence here and in scores of other places in the Bible that Israel would be regathered under the banner or the ensign of Jesus Christ. Then to further identify the fulfillment of this prophecy, in the next verse, God gives us the direction the Israelites would travel to the land of their regathering. Verse 14, Isaiah 11, But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, toward the west. Now let's read the third verse of Isaiah 18 again about the ensign upon the land shadowing with wings. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he lifteth up an ensign on the mountains. I submit to you that the colonization of this North American wilderness by a people professing Jesus Christ, by a people flying to the west, fits without a doubt these Bible prophecies. Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 18, the land shadowing with wings, can fit only this great and God-blessed Christian nation. In case you know little of America's foundation on Jesus Christ, let me read some phrases from just a few of the original colonial charters of the 1600s. The first charter for the colony of Virginia from James I has this phrase, for the furtherance of so noble a work which may, by the providence of Almighty God, hereafter tend to the glory of His divine majesty in propagating the Christian religion, and so on. The chapter for the Plymouth Council stated, The purpose of that settlement was, quote, in hope thereby to advance the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God Almighty. The Maryland Charter ended with the statement that no interpretation of the charter itself was to be allowed where, quote, God's holy and true Christian religion might in any wise suffer, end of quote. The Rhode Island Charter said one of its aims was so that the inhabitants might pursue, quote, their sober, serious, and religious intentions, of godly edifying themselves and one another in the holy Christian faith and worship. The Mayflower Compact, which we all used to memorize in school years ago, stated that its signers had undertaken to plant this colony, quote, for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith, unquote, and on and on. There is only one America. There has never been another like it. There shall be none like it in the future, 
and we alone of all the peoples of the earth were gathered from foreign lands, from the ends of the earth, coming to the ends and raised upon the mountains, Jesus Christ held up before all nations and proclaimed as sovereign and Lord by those who came. Yes, America is without doubt the land shadowing with wings beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. America is the land to which millions came, seeing and hearing the beacon light of Christian liberty burning brightly on the fair shores of the ancient wilderness. The people of the world took heed and watched in awe as a little one, a people terrible from their beginning, became a thousand and a small one, a strong nation. And before we read on, I should mention that wonderful book, The Christian History of the Constitution. We have it available, and you'll find the true history of America has been searched out and put in print in this book. It is not in the public schools, it should be, but it is not, but praise God, it is being recommended and used by some church and Christian schools in America. It is available for an offering of $10 to this ministry. My address is America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. Remember that box number, 5334. This is perhaps the best textbook on the origins of our government to see print in a hundred years. It has 480 pages. It is a large book. The full title is The Christian History of the Constitution of the United States. The author begins the story in England and Europe, among the people whose conscience was being awakened by the preaching of God's Word in what became the Protestant Reformation. America was no happenstance. God's timetable brought the discovery of America, the printing press, and the Protestant Reformation upon the world scene, and America was not the cause. America was the result of the preaching of God's Word to men who then truly believed the Bible. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and they came to America. You write for the October packet, that is free. And if you want a copy of the Christian History of the Constitution, please send an offering of at least $10 to help pay for the expenses of this ministry. My address again, America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. I believe there is probably no finer gift you could give yourself or your children than a book about the Christian origins of this nation, the Christian history of the Constitution. All right, back to Isaiah 18. For in the next verses, it would seem that this land shadowing with wings this land founded by a people who came at the call of the root of Jesse, the ensign Jesus Christ, is going to be cut and pruned by God Almighty. Verse 4 and 5. For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider in my dwelling place like a clear heat upon the herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For afore the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. What is this? Do you mean to say that God will actually cut away or prune away a part of this land shadowing with wings? That's what he said. And it would happen before the harvest, while still in the bud, while the grapes were still yet sour. And remember, in prophecy, in both the Old and the New Testament, the harvest is a term used to describe the events of the very end of this age. In the parable of the tares and the wheat in Matthew 13, Jesus speaks of the harvest, and then he says in verse 39, the harvest is the end of the world. In Revelation 14, where John saw the vision of the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle, verse 14, we read in verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. 
That is verse 15 of Revelation 14. And if you have been with me for several months, you'll recall my series on the destruction of mystery Babylon the Great began in the very next chapter, chapter 15. So the destruction of Babylon is a part of the events of the harvest. In verse 19 of Revelation 14 it says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. That winepress of the wrath of God is apparently the judgment of the nations. For we read of it again after the destruction of Babylon in chapter 19 in relation to the return of Jesus Christ. In verse 11 of Revelation 19, we read that Jesus comes from heaven and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. In verse 15 it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So the harvest is the destruction of the wicked in preparing the earth for the righteous reign of Jesus Christ in his kingdom on the earth. Therefore, when we read in Isaiah of the founding and growth of a great Christian nation, and it becomes obvious that that nation is the United States of America, it should come as no surprise that that nation must go through some pruning, some cutting away of evil and wickedness from it in preparation for the age to come. Now whether you agree with me or not that the land described in Isaiah 18 is the United States of America, you certainly must agree that there is much in America which must be cut and pruned away before we can be incorporated into Christ's future kingdom on the earth. And just as in Matthew 13, it is the wicked who are removed from the kingdom, not the righteous, so in Isaiah 18, the cutting and the pruning in the land shadowing with wings will be the removal of the wicked, not the removal of the Christians. May God forgive us, but we are in such a state of sin and iniquity that we now allow doctors to murder one half of the babies conceived in America, and it is getting worse, not better. Our leaders deliberately caused Southeast Asia to fall to the Red Bolsheviks, and reports coming to me indicate the communist butchers have murdered at least 200,000 people in South Vietnam, and the administration and the news media do not even mention it. Our non-Christian Secretary of State with the approval of the rest of our non-Christian government, signed the agreements which turned Southeast Asia over to the Reds, and we call them men of peace, and we hear no word of condemnation from the clergy. No, whether we like it or not, the wicked will be removed, false prophets will be silenced, and the proponents of economic and political ideologies in opposition to the word of God will be taken out of the land. That is what will be pruned. That is what will be cut off in the land shadowing with wings. Before I run out of time, I should offer two other things which could be of great help to Christians who are just beginning to read and study their Bibles. I have a four-and-one-half-hour Bible study on the parables of Matthew 13. These parables show very plainly that there is no pre-tribulation rapture of the church, as so many teach. The rapture theory is false doctrine. It is one of the great deceptions of the Antichrist at the end of the age. I also have a book, on the prophecies of Ezekiel titled, The Bible Says Russia Will Invade America. Many of you realize there is every possibility of a future war between Russia and America, but what most do not know is the war is already underway, and millions of the enemies of our nation have already invaded this land. They didn't come in military uniforms, they didn't come carrying the hammer and the sickle. 
They came in civilian clothes, many of them posing as refugees. Most of them have become citizens, and God only knows how many of them are now in the United States government. And all of this is foretold in Bible prophecy. Well, we didn't finish Isaiah 18. God willing, we'll do that next week and show how that brief passage foretells the cleansing of this nation, the removal of the wicked, and the turning of this nation to Jesus Christ. Then we'll turn again to the great seal and study the olive branch, the arrows, the stars, and so on. Until next week when I return with the Bible and the great seal of the United States, God willing, this is Pastor Emery saying goodbye.